Ryan, welcome to Startup Grind. Thanks for having me. Nice to see you all. Before we dive into the topic of today, can you briefly introduce yourself? Dr. Ryan Manuel, I was a professor at Chinese politics at Hong Kong University. I still teach sometimes before I left a few years ago to run Bilby. Before that, I was a sort of prime ministerial advisor in Australia. And before that, as a professor, and I began life, however, as a, as a computer programmer, as a coder. So it's, a, it's an unusual skill set, and that's what led us to, to Bilby, I guess. And it's a combination of speech writing and combination with code. That's, that's pretty pretty interesting background. It's unusual. It's definitely unusual. <laughs> so today's event is going to be slightly different from regular startup grand events because we're going to see a live demo of Bilby. And you showed me this uh, a few weeks back and I was super impressed. So b before you share your screen, could you give us sort of the elevator pitch of Bilby? Sure. Bilby takes everything that governments do, and then it uses artificial intelligence to make that comprehensible. So everyone's familiar with, with software such as Bloomberg for tracking financial prices or, or Palantir for doing models on your own data. Bilby, what that does is it does it for governments. So when we say a co-pilot for governments, it, it, it goes through everything that, that any government puts out. So that includes press releases, regulations, laws, official newspaper statements, and then using artificial intelligence, it models and predicts what comes next because governments have to constantly tell people what they want them to do. And then the other part is, is it does all your re reporting and everything for you automatically. It's a first artificial intelligence co-pilot. It's trying to add AI to governments, basically. So anything a government puts out, you read in and then you will analyze it. Yes. Yeah. So this it's about 60 odd million documents a year, say just for China. So it, it the, the AI is busy. It reads a lot. <laughs> it reads a lot, yeah. It's good. It's 20, 24, seven, uh, you know, seven days a week. And and the reason we're, we're here today is because you were the semi-final winner of the Hong Kong Fast Track and Hong Kong Scale Up competition. Can we give us just a short, what was that that you won? That's a, a competition for, for FinTech Week here in Hong Kong. And so it's looking at innovative technologies from around the world that might change how we do FinTech. And it brings all the startups to Hong Kong. Uh, as the Hong Kong winner, we missed out on the airfare part of that, but it's great to represent Hong Kong at home. And yeah, and as, as everyone will hopefully see soon, it's a very Hong Kong birthed uh, technology. The, what we do is, is very relevant for Hong Kong as well. So it's good to, good to be a part of that. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, let's do like this. You share your screen now and I will let you know when I see it. So you can see here that it's welcoming you back. Thank you, AI. That's very kind of you. I've asked it to tell me everything about, you know, happening recently. So you can see sort of what's happening on the Hainan Tropical Rainforest National Park. Again, we it, random documents in Chinese and English. Uh, this gets at what I was saying, where everything that comes out of, of the come out of China's government is available. But the real power of Bilby is on the is on the left, the the assistant, which is an, an AI analyzer. And on the right, which is a, a macro analyzer. So this is tracking every article that comes in, all of the things that are happening across all the different lines. Uh, the sentiment, so everything that a government is saying, positive and negative sentiment. Uh, this maps it by, by sector. So you can see this is particularly useful for those in the financial services, fintech being a big focus of what we do. So it looks at where the Chinese government is, is up or down is overweight or underweight in terms of each sector. So finance, real estate, healthcare, materials uh, shows you what percentage of what they're saying for each sector, uh, the sentiment. So unsurprisingly, you can see here recently, China's government has been much more negative on real estate and interestingly also on information technology. And then finally, you can see that it shows the policy life cycle stage and the importance of who's speaking. And this is again, getting at that real power of what computers are good at. So they go through everything that's said and they say, okay, is this an early indicator or a late indicator? And how important are the different bodies that are saying these things? And so having these, these sort of overview tools at your fingertips, along with an assistant, allows you basically to have a constant guide of, of what's happening in China every day. Uh, we also do it for other countries, but, but today we'll focus mainly on China. Again, going back to the, to the Hong Kong thing. So that's our sort of 
terminal. Behind there is a range of algorithms, so graph databases, that's how we can tell how important things are. And then finally, every report we put out. So this is the five most important official signals on Taiwan, for example. This is a, something we, we often get asked to do, which is take the terminal and take all of our, our data holdings and figure out what's going on. So this built an AI model for everything that China's government has said about Taiwan. It read all of the documents, the official documents on Taiwan, there's about 6,000. And then it summarized, it sort of pulled out the five most important ones. But the main power of this is you can ask questions of it. So a common question, for example, on Taiwan is, will the PLA invade? And rather than having to sort of sit through keywords or anything else like that, you can see that Bilby actually goes through and it will, it will analyze every document for you, synthesize it, and it will answer the question. So you can see here, as it says, there's nothing explicit that China's government has said. However, it's important to note that public statements may not fully reflect a government's internal strategies or plans. The Chinese government has also repeatedly stated that it will take all necessary measures to protect national sovereignty and ensure territorial integrity. Again, this is the power of having an AI engine is firstly, everything's at your fingertips. Secondly, it writes reports for you. So it says here, the Taiwan Affairs Office has emphasized cooperation. Please tell me what this cooperation means and why we should I'll keep the title in there, public statements. And rather than having to train yourself in Chinese, in polit political science, in Taiwan, in everything like that, you can see that, that what's most handy about this is, is it'll go through everything for you and, and spit it all out. So you can see here again, it's going through the one China principle, the goal of reunification. But as it's going away, as it's sort of thinking through all of its things, you also can allow it, you can kind of allow it to go really in depth. So, so when it says national sovereignty, what sort of language? Again, it really is a, a really top class analyst that's going through different types of language and, and different sources and all those sorts of things. The final other part, sorry, I'm letting that think for a second. Um, so you can see the other part of that that's so useful is it gives you all of the tools I showed you before, but in natural language form. So here you can see a report that, that is written on everything that China has said about Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. And so it's talking about Hanzhong. So we're going to highlight that and I'm going to say, who is this? Are they important and should startups in Hong Kong? And so you can see it's it's looked up, it's figured out who Han Zhang is. It's up to date. So you can see here, it tells you his current position, but he says he was previously a member of the Politburo Standing Committee. Again, that's the power of having a database feeding in as opposed to sort of things like say ChatGPT or other things like that, where it's always building off of old data. As you can see analyzed it. You can you can see here that it, it reads very well. It reads all the actors. It reads everything. It tells me how important it is. Now what I'm going to do is is also just go into the reports themselves. Who did he meet with? And is that person? I think we 15 years ago, or maybe a little longer, 20 years ago, I was at dinner in Hong Kong. We talked about a, this book that explained who everybody was. And this is that book, but it's in real time but it's in in real time and it's for every yeah. country so you can also see here it's it's telling you who he met with and says this person's important they play a crucial role or there's mutual interest if your interest or the interest of your startup align with these areas cooperation sections then gobesh's role could be you know it's it's actually thinking for you but of course what probably makes this most useful to you as a swedish speaker although your english is obviously perfect is that it also acts as a universal translator so everything that we've done so far can also be done in any language in real time. And again, this gets it at the power of artificial intelligence. It doesn't just, you know, it's actually, it's augmenting us as humans. Like there just is no way that you can be across as any human being who the speaker of the UAE legislature is, is Han Zhang important, speak Swedish, <laughs> read Chinese, <laughs> speak English, and, and do all those things at once. And yeah. so uh, we think that there's there's a huge amount of potential here as well. I mean, this is sort of the great startup cliche is we're just getting started, but we, we literally are just getting started down this path. But already you can see how powerful what we can do is. It's having 
the whole world at your fingertips and you can engage in it in real time. Um, and we think that's going to make a huge boost for understanding in general. I mean, governments, every government has this issue of, of trying to get people to, yes, do what it wants, but also just explain itself to make things clear, to, to talk to markets, but also to talk to officials, but also to talk to people. And to do that for anywhere, anytime, anywhere in the world is, is I think, incredibly exciting. Obviously, I'm a bit biased since it's, it's my company, but it's very hard to not get excited when you look at the possibilities for that. And I mean, this is today, right? This is like right in front of us right now. So you can just imagine even in and the, the, time. Yeah, and, the, and the development has been very, very fast. But you also showed me a, a point cloud last time, sort of all the relationships. Yes. Uh, so what this is built on is, uh, hopefully you can see the point cloud now. I don't see the, the gray area. Oh, good. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to look for this same person. And I'm, I'm sort of exposing the inner workings here, given this is a fireside chat. So you can see on the right hand side, bank company, ESG, Jix, obviously that's a, a finance code, media, person, pilot, region, state body. So here you can see how the computer can read how important Hanjung is because it's got Hanjung, but this is everything that Hanjung is, you know, all the committees he still sits on, what he's the party head of, what this relates to, where he's born. Uh, so you can see here the other people who are born there, the business is headquartered there. And what this does is, again, it, it just allows governments to explain themselves, it allows us to, to just see what kind of is, is most important. So you can see here, Here's a company from Ningbo. They happen to be headquartered the same place that Hanjung is built. So again, that goes back to the, to the description before when it was telling you about what sorts of companies should meet Hanjung. You can ask it anything in that sense and see what's happening. You can also see what's coming next. So we talked about pilots. So these are the pilots that are currently running in Zishi City. So pilots are very good ways of seeing what's coming because China likes to try, in China, they like to try out new policies in, in local areas. And so you can see here, these are the other places that, that might, you know, if you want to look at, say, this particular pilot, here's everywhere else that that pilot is running in China. And suddenly you can see that this, vi you know, this vast Chinese state becomes actually quite understandable. I mean, you know, if you know the banks, if you know the companies, if you know what they're doing, if you know all of these things, this black box that we always hear about how China is so impossible to work with or work on, I, I think the reverse. China is much easier to work with than any other government because it tells you everything. It tells you everything you need to know to do business with it. And uh, that I think is incredibly powerful. Yeah, and this was the point cloud we started when you showed me a few weeks back. And it's so impressive because as you said, if, if there is a pilot on a certain type of hospital in, in one region, then you can find other all the other pilots in China yeah. for that. Or, or the companies that might be affected. So you can see here, or even the people who are born there. The final part that makes AI so effective, by the way, is you can take any person. So this person is called Du, and then you can see, you know, this is Ningbo, Jani and electronics. Again, not something I'm particularly familiar with. But you can find how to get from one actor to another actor at any given time. So let's say put in, we're going to see a lot of dots in a second because obviously everything that's, that's in English in finance. So you can see here suddenly, bang. <laughs> so let's pick like the state taxation administration and let's pick our friend Han Zhong and let's see how we can get from one to the next and how far. So they're very close to each other, right? So this, you can see. Straight away, you, it's it's one or two steps between Hanjung and the state taxation authority and administration. And what that means, of course, for businesses, for, for financial institutions, for governments themselves, is that you can instantly know who's who, but also you can instantly, for any signal coming out, see how important it is. Which which I showed you before on on my screen. You can you can actually perfectly track for any document how important various things are. But you can also, you can get a feel for just how, how things work. You can sort of wallow in the country in a way that was impossible without technology. I mean, there's just, without, I guess, going to Beijing and having hundreds of meetings, how could that information be available to anyone? So, yeah, we think that there's a huge amount of power in this. And uh, I guess that, that's why it's great to have to, for you to give us a chance to talk about sort of AI for governments. It's, it's not been talked about yet. It really is an early field. It's, I think, even more exciting than 
any other use case is just the power of what you can do for a government is incredible. Yeah, I, I can see this being used in many different governments, but as you, the degrees of separation, you have a path, how do I get to that person? That's really, really impressive. When we looked at the demo before, you showed uh, how you had one official document and it sort of color coded the important parts. Yeah, so what you're doing a great job here is unpacking the inner workings of, of how our, our terminal works. So how, our, how well, and this sort of, it's kind of interesting because it's kind of how we got started as well. This used to be my life. I used to have to read a lot of documents like this. So you can see here, hopefully on screen, you can see sort yep. of some Chinese. I don't really need to be able to read Chinese. You can see who the, the document is about, which is Xi Jinping. He's holding a meeting about health and education. And so, you know, you can see if you were a Chinese speaker, you could, you could read this, right? But even as a Chinese speaker, there's parts of this that computers, even computers can even be more useful than, than native speakers. So this here, for example, is something behind all our technology. It's, it's called the sentence level sentiment analyzer. So it's our own developed tool. And what it does is it unpacks the language of documents itself at the sentiment, at the sentence level. And why is that so important? Because when you're looking at a document that's official like this, and it's about Xi Jinping, and by the way, this is not just a China thing. I, I used to do this for a living. Every government wants to say something positive about itself. But if you're working for a business, if you're working for a financial institution, you, you know, you need to know the real word on the street. You actually need to know what they actually think. And so you have to strip away all of the language. And so what we've done here is it's just a very simple graphical representation of, of one of our, our algorithms where you can choose what type of language you want to get rid of or keep. So you can see at the moment we've ticked, we want to keep in there international language, company, legal, but we want to, to remove from our, from our analysis, from our sentiment analysis, language about the party or about the government. And so we're gonna paste in the text of what we showed before, uh, we'll submit it to the census level sentiment analyzer and it'll, it'll go away. And again, you can do this for everything that a government puts out. You can strip out what type of language. And so you can see up on your screen that originally, if you looked at the document as a whole, sort of just unfiltered, it's 84% on a, on a scale of positivity. So where zero is the most negative, 100% is the most positive. By taking out the party in the government language, it, it nudges that back. It, it gets it more back towards the, meet, the middle. But also you can see it marks up each sentence and so you can see what type of language it is and you can see what it's basing its models on and you can be confident in that way of what it's doing. And this gets to, I think, what's very powerful about AI for businesses, which is that uh, when looking at governments, which is that you actually can do applied AI. One of the problems with the current models that are sort of on the market is that they're so black box, you can't trust them. You can't go all the way down and see what's behind the black box. You can't see the sentence. You can't see the working. You can't, you know, you just, you're trusting everybody else. And not just that, you're having to feed your data into it and then trust the results. And at the enterprise level, that's where AI hasn't yet made that jump into being a truly killer app. Whereas where, again, governments have such an opportunity with AI is that you can see every document, you can see you can trace down to the sentence itself of why the AI, why the machine learning model made that decision. Why do we think that's important? Is you know how do you trace all the people on importance? How do you trace the sentence that mm. leads us to say it's positive or negative sentiment? And that sort of ability to go all that micro level way down, I think, is just so exciting because it opens up a whole world of possibilities at the enterprise level. Again, if you're an analyst, your average analyst, you, know, you can't put something in front of your boss and be like, we should sell. Yeah. Because boss is just going to go, well, well, that's nice. How do you know? And in your head, you're like, well, it's true. You know, and even if you even if you were a very honest analyst and you're like, I asked ChatGP, which is an extraordinary bit of technology. And by the way, we should all use it. You know, good luck with that, <laughs> you know, come, come bonus time. But even if you say that, then you can't persuade, you know, even yourself, how do you walk in and have that confidence as an analyst and vice versa? If you're an executive, executives don't need to know every document. They don't need to know every sentence, but they do need to know, should I meet with Hanjong? Mm. Like, you know, give me the one minute overview here. Give, you know, I'm very, really busy. And then you have to have that trust, trust in the system, trust in what your team has done or trust in what our AI has done. And that's so important to us as a company. And that's 
why when I sort of said before, I feel like we're just getting started. I, I, you know, we can see it by that ability to go to the document level for enterprises. I mean, the mind sort of boggles, like suddenly executives get freed up to talk to people and manage and be executive. Analysts don't have to troll through hundreds of thousands, millions, you know, it's just, it's impossible. Even, even use Google, you just, you have so much more time available to you. Yeah, and, and you can quickly click to that piece of text where that decision came from. Yeah. So, yeah, that, the transparency is super important. I'm, I mean, a few fintech weeks back, there was somebody on stage talking about insurance and AI. It's like, how do you prove what's going on in the black box? But you are showing what's going on in the black box. And the other thing is, as we looked at this question about uh, who knows who. So, if you want to write an introduction email, you could take, take something from this and say, hey, this is the reason I want to, you to help me introduce you to this person who will introduce me to this person. So you can be, become much more efficient. Or you could get the computer to write it for you. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, okay. It's kind of, I mean, in Swedish if you want. I mean, that's, oh, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's really exciting. I mean, it, yeah. it's, it's genuinely such an exciting time to build and I think that it will only grow. Yeah. And this is when you did the demo for me. I mean, I get the same kind of goosebump feeling right now. It's like, this is so much possibility, but we all work in these markets and now everything becomes very transparent. Now you mentioned China. Are mm. there any other countries you've been looking at doing the similar with or on, on their data? We, we've actually done it for India already. Uh, built all the models and, and have the documents coming in. So just to give a quick example, it's very different. And that's part of what makes it so fun. So hopefully you can see my screen again. Oh yeah, yeah. Really great screen. So this time what we're gonna look at is we'll look at say foreign companies, Say, let's say all of them, big foreign companies in India, we're going to look maybe at the ministries that regulate them centrally. And what makes India so fascinating is that you have central bureaucrats. So you can see these ministries, you know, these are central and this, this is the Indian administrative service. So these people are they're sent down from Delhi in this way. Unusually, India does function a lot like China because, of course, everything normally is so different. But this central ministry, what you can see here is that allows you to see who the decision makers are. So these are the seven. So if let's have a look at Uber is regulated by the roads and transportation ministry, among others. And in that there is our friend Kailash Chand Gupta. Now, Kailash Chand Gupta's relationships come partly, you know, they come from many things, but partly they come from where they were born. So Madhya Pradesh. And what year they entered into this centralized system I'm talking about. So here in 1992. And again, the wonderful nature of AI is we can see everybody who's in uh, Kailash's batch year. So these are all the other cadres that came out that year. We can look at Madhra Pradesh itself and we can see, okay, what are the companies that are in that state? Uh, who are the other people that, you know, what's its budget? Like, tell me more about this state. Now, why is that so important other than Obviously, we had to very quickly see between 439 bureaucrats which one you have to talk to. Why that's so important is in, in India, as opposed to China, at the local levels, people use the vernacular. So you don't, like, the central bureaucrats that we're looking at now, you can see on my screen here, they have to interact with elected and nominated officials. And they actually literally speak different languages. If you're in Maharashtra, mm. for example, you, your incentive is to speak Marathi. And if you are sent to Maharashtra from Delhi, you have to do everything in English and you have to report it back to Delhi. And so the delta, like what's the difference between what's being said in Marathi and what's being said in English, suddenly you can see how even though India and China are such different countries, it's incredibly exciting to see how the tools can be reworked and remapped. And so India and China are the two that we currently have running. Uh, next is Vietnam, Korea, Japan, Indonesia, uh, the EU. So. Uh, watch this space. It's really spinning up very fast. And I guess where we're also incredibly excited is at the moment we're looking in a country and it's great to see everything a country can do. But when you look at you know, inter-country effects, as in what is being said in Korea that affects China and affects India. So a great example of this, for example, is if you want to look at semiconductors in mm -hmm. China. So I'm going to get up on my screen again, some internal software. This says in Chinese. Uh, you can see I'm highlighting it now. This says semiconductor, so bantag. And you can see that I've, I've excluded everything that's being said in the private newspapers about it. And it's looking at this for, there you go, about five month period. And so there's a lot of stuff being said about semiconductors, right? But you can see how overwhelmingly positive it is. 
And so you have to really, it's, it takes a bit of work for us to get down to anything negative that China's government has said about semiconductors. So in a five month period among 21,000, there are only 84 documents with anything negative sent. And as you can see, a lot of them spike on one day, which probably means that it's all to do with one issue alone. Now, that's useful data. It's incredibly useful data, obviously, because you can say, well, this is what China's government thinks. But the best semiconductor data on China in the world is actually Korean export data because it's daily. It's 21% of China's semiconductors. We can map which companies are getting those 21% and have a really good daily update of the ups and downs of semiconductors just by using a computer. Like that is literally impossible. There is just absolutely no way that I could say before AI, before you had machine learning, that the big issue for China's government was the negative day was the 24th of August on 22nd, but that that doesn't actually match with Korean export data. And it took three weeks for that to flow down to the flow of semiconductors going to factories in Shandong. And mm. I mean, it, it's, it sounds like science fiction. But that's that's where we are. Like that's that's just it's a great time to to, to be building this sort of stuff. Yeah, and, and then you take and not only just the, the data about a semiconductor, but you also Korean language and Chinese, and it, and it all works out, and you get it presented to you in English or in Swedish. It's it, it, it's a beautiful system. Before we conclude the demo, who are your, as you mentioned, you're helping people. Who are your target customers? And sort of how do you monetize this? Is this a subscription or? Yeah, at the moment we have people who we've built specific models for. So as you can see by the by the question on the flyer, like one of the parts of AI is you have to build a model. Mm. So we have at the moment we have six sort of big strategic partners and they get us to build specific models that look at everything in a vertical. So we have yep. a, a buy side firm that looks at the sectors. So you saw that on, on screen that shows who's up and who's down by, by different sectors. We have uh, a big tech giant that gets us to look at everything and payments. Uh, we have another company that does pharmaceuticals. So that's everything has changed in China's pharmaceutical regulations. Uh, startups, we have one that gets us to look at, at private markets and, and different changes in the parts of private markets where they have exposure into different regions. Uh, yeah, so we, we've been working mainly with different specific custom built models and now we're shifting 15th of November, we launch our first generic terminal, which is open to everybody. So you can be one of our, our trial members where it builds it for you on the fly. And you have the assistant. You can see at the moment when I, when I look at the news myself, I don't have the assistant yet because it's not launched till November the 15th. Uh, we, we do only beta testing for that right now. And we made it available to some very early partners of ours, the ones that we built the models for. I would say it works beautifully. As you said, you have a number of partners oh, who yeah. help you develop Sorry. this. Now you are also in November now launching those sort of the terminals so anybody else can, can try it. How big a market do you think it, there is for for this? I mean, look, it's a very large potential market because government activity touches on pretty much everything. And, and we've seen with say Bloomberg that one of the really fun things about information as a business, as a service, is that it then creates industries of its own. So, you know, I mean, before a Bloomberg terminal, Amrit question would have also applied to all sort of to bond information or to stock information. I mean, it sort of seems ridiculous now that you had to get bond prices by calling up different brokers. Like that to us is, is what we think about governments. Like it just seems ridiculous that you have to go and, you know, try and search in Google. That just doesn't make sense. And so what we're hoping is that, that new markets will develop, but definitely within the current market, it's a, I think it's a multi-billion dollar market quite comfortably. If you think of Palantir, Palantir is what, 30 bill market cap. That's mainly just with governments, uh, you know, that's that's a sort of similar sector. What Palantir has done, of course, is it, it just makes algorithms that you put your own data into and it, it runs on that. That's uh, from a fraud background. We you know we, we think that the definitely the opportunity for providing information is in we bring the data to companies. So therefore, there's less issues with compliance, there's less issues with sort of passing your data to another company. There's there's Palantir has done in that sense a very good job of going to kind of building that, that long-term trust where, where people push its data into it. Mm. Uh, we think that there's probably a, a quicker market gain by bringing data in, as in working just as a vendor. 
Um, yeah, it, it's it's definitely a, a big potential market. Um, yeah. And there's so many. Yeah, there's so many. More markets. Uh, that's the other interesting part. I, I mean, I really think that that's where it's it's hard to predict, not just because, you know, the TAM is in the tens of billions mm -hmm. probably, but, you know, we, we don't know. We, we wouldn't have known that hedge funds would work the way they did before Bloomberg. I think, you know, high frequency trading, imagine that before technology kicked in. So we're hoping that similar stuff could maybe happen in, in working with governments as well. Yeah. And, and everything you show is so, so powerful. Now, I looked at the interface and realized, how long has it taken to sort of bring all of this to life? I mean, it's like the old joke. I, I started working on China 17 years ago and I began as a computer programmer. So it was sort of in the back of my mind then. Bilby is a company though, we've been going for a couple of years. Our first model was, was run, I, I bootstrapped. I was working in, in, I sort of stepped out of finance. I stepped out of academia for a little bit to, to try and see how we could bring the power of technology. Again, I, I was really motivated by how finance used tech really well. And I thought, well, why don't we use this for politics? And then the first model uh, hit the market in, as in was, was used by anyone. That's just sort of an algorithm. Our first algorithm was out in 2021, early 2021, and it, it actually, it, it predicted the online education crash. Mm. And so at that point, we had to very fast, very quickly make a company and build a team and try and a very large investment bank kind of instantly wanted a, a very big trial. So we had to build the plane while we were flying it really. Uh, so two and a half years. Okay. And how big is the team today? Uh, Full-time staff equivalents, about 10, 11. It, it, it comes in and out. We have a, a bunch of wonderful, very passionate interns who sometimes come and join and that can swell our ranks by quite a bit. But the, the core team is nearly all, everyone codes. It's, it's our head of sales. And, and so Chris is in the chat. You can see, you know, Chris does sales and partnerships, but is a, is a good coder. Denise, who, who does product can code. Uh, even I can code. Everyone can, it's, it's very much a kind of, special forces type model, I guess, where everybody has to be able to jump in. Okay. But at the same time, learning to code and knowing how to code is super important because there's so much you can do. So you mentioned that you got that big client. Do you have a number of investors as well, or are you looking for investors? We will probably open around in, in a little bit and we'll be looking for investors. They're talking to some people have reached out to us. So we mainly have we, angels and strategic investors so far. Thank you for their support. So the, the bank I was telling you about, the, the CEO of that bank actually led our last round personally. So um, we're trying to hit a sustainable business. And a lot of what's attractive about investors is the support they can give us in terms of, you know, help on the really bleeding edge of technology, finding staff, access to other markets. Um, yeah. So we always welcome, you know, investors can really help. You need that capital, right? And, and it's even more than just the money. It, it really is the networks that they can bring and, and our ability to get this to more partners and, and get it out in the market and get more people using it so it can continue to improve. Yeah, getting in front of, it, in front of people. You mentioned, as you said, everybody at the company can code. What, what technologies are behind Bilby? What is it built on? It's easier to think of it in concepts. So it's built on our own data pipelines. Yep. So we have to bring in all our own data and because that gives us quality control and make sure that it's public. Everything has to be public. You know, there can't be private data. Otherwise there's issues, all sorts of issues of copyright and IP. Then there's a separate team. Once, we, once we've pulled all the data in from around the world, so you, again, you saw the, the millions of documents. After that, what we do is we store it in, in a central cloud. And that means that then there's an algorithms team. So their job is to make the actual specific ways of cutting the data. And then finally, we have a software team, which turns it into all of the things you've seen today, terminals, you know, custom software. We have we have specific bits of kit for various firms. For, you know, we, we built specific models for people who just need it for one thing. Mm. So yeah, so there's three broad types of technology. There's yeah, data pipelines technology, then there's the clouds and the, obviously the spinning up models. 
all that sort of work and the, the AI itself and the machine learning itself. And then finally, there's there's software engineering and, and classic engineering and making sure that everything works. And, and Yeah, and then it also that it makes it, it looks good. And you also, you know, you want to be able to work with the tool and also to have it broad in within companies that is going to be easy to use. I mean, if you're really a, a buff and you want this, then you make it work. Yeah. Uh, as you said, you've been around for kind of two and a half years. Sort of a general, what what advice would you give a startup aiming to build something on AI today? I think the best advice is find a problem that, that just is worth it, right? Like, it's funny how, you know, you talk to all startup founders and they get that, that haunted look in their face. I told, you know, we, you and I were talking about this and I was sort of like, I mean, I shouldn't say don't because I want people to start companies, but it is that hard. But if, you, if you're making something that's so cool that it's worth, you know, I, I don't think of what I do as work. I just think of it as like solving this insanely large crossword puzzle that's been annoying me for 15 years and someone pays me to solve it. Like that's just, I'll put up with, you know, my audit not working for that. I'll put up with like no holiday. Like I'll put up with anything. Like just, I just want to know what the, what the answer is. And if you can find a problem that, that, that makes you that sort of socially unpalatable, then you, you should start a company. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The tech right now means that you might actually be able to solve it. I mean, you asked when I started working on Bilby, like I started when I started programming and reading the news and being like, why don't we just like use computers? This is so much easier. That was in 1999. I mean, I just can't believe I get to solve it now. I, it's that's that's just such a gift. So yeah, so if you're as unusually sort of wired as, as someone like like, you should totally start a company because you'll get to solve something that has bugged you. And and how amazing is that? Like that's that's pretty cool, I think. <laughs> and if you're out there and you're running a regular a traditional company, or you work for, or you're part of a government, mm -hmm. what is your advice to people? How do you get your colleagues to adopt tools like this? or AI in general? I think you've got to find use cases. You've just got to, you've got to, I mean, you've got to hire a brilliant company where we use our technology. No, uh, you you have to show that it works, like seeing is believing. And if, if we just sit and we just say AI, 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 it doesn't really work. But if, if we push it, uh, humans are so much cooler than computers. We'll, we'll think of different things to push it. We'll, we'll think of different directions, you know, like what I've shown you today is is sort of, just now, I mean, it's it's not even, I mean, what, what's coming in six months is even mm -hmm. more exciting, if that makes sense. Like, I think as an executive, you just got to, you've got to lead. You've got to say, this is, it's going to happen. Why not be on the front of it? Uh, that's part one. And then secondly, as an executive, you have to, you have to just force it to get to the, you know, like, just, just don't do that sort of thing of like, oh, the AI figured it out. You know, you've got to be, no, no, no. No, no, like I have this friend, actually an investor in, in Bilby, who has this great, he's the world's expert in Chinese financial systems. He has this great phrase, how does the money get across the border? Mm. You know, like if you can't tell me how you got this answer as an executive, you know, go go back to the starting, like make me, make me a machine that can, like show me. And then the third part as an executive is you've got to start knowing that you have trust. And I mean, that links the first two things. Like if people don't, have trust in, in that like it's just you're going to spend a lot of money and, and people are going to kind of get more annoyed than when they start with but if you start being like we are going to build something that people can trust and that's because we're going to know every part of it and it's going to be enterprise grade and it's going to in that sense mean we're ahead of everybody else then i think i mean you, you can see it's it's extraordinary yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. It's extraordinary uh, and, and sort of the last question before we move into the Q&A, sort of in this ever evolving world of AI, how do you stay on top of things that's going on all over the place? I build, it's the only way. I just think build. build, yes, but like one of the great things about building is then when you talk to someone else and you find out what they're building, they'll, you know, you want to make something together and then that by definition will keep you on, on at the frontier. If you passively try and stay at the frontier, i.e. read and, I mean, reading is important, but like, just build. Yeah. Find, build. find that problem and have a crack, as we say in Australia, have a go. If you build <laughs> it, then you will need to find the answer, then you will yeah. gain the information. And and it's there, like, you know, that's the Stack Overflow way, right? So. <laughs> yeah. Ryan, 
big thank you for being a guest at Starter Garden. This has been an amazing session. I mean, I'm, I'm so psyched about what we can what can be done. Thank you for having me, and and yeah. thanks to everybody who came for your for your questions as well. So what we'll do now is I'll switch over to the chat. I see there's a few.